Yeah. Hi, everybody. Welcome to my talk, Harness the Power of HTTP Header to Secure Your Web Apps. Actually, I'm surprised to see so many people for such a dry topic, so I will try to make it interesting. Um, so about who am I? Um, so my name is Daniel Gartman. I am working as a software engineer at Zurich Engineering in London. And my role is um, yeah, to ensure that the software that we ship to our customers is secure. And if you have any feedback or question after the talk, don't hesitate to tweet me or to send me an email. Um, so uh, regarding the agenda of this talk, uh, we will start first to see uh, what's wrong with the web. And then um, we will have a look into uh, strict transport security, public key pinning, and content security policy. So just to know, how many of you are develop working on a web application right now? OK, almost most of you. And how many of you have all three uh, HTTP headers deployed? Anybody? One, two? OK. How many at least two headers out of them, out of the three? One? OK, not so many. So yeah, this talk is for you. Um, OK, so let's start. So what's wrong with the web? So actually, the web is the most popular app delivery platform we ever had. And another thing is actually the core communication protocol are actually insecure because when the web started there were a couple of universities just changing some data and uh, they were not really thinking uh, about adversary back then but um, yeah and another problem as well with web security is that's often misunderstood it's uh, quite common that I hear uh, facts such as oh just use the post HTTP verb in order to protect against cross-site request forgery which is totally wrong or things, oh, my web app is behind a web application firewall, so I don't need to care about security. These kind of things I can see very, very often uh, at customer or so. And uh, I think that's as well a problem. Actually, yeah, it can be as well pretty complex. And so if you look about how the web works, um, we have the user agents, the server. And when you click on a link, basically, you, the browser sends a request. And then you get some resource, and then you get some code back. It can be some JavaScript, CSS, HTML. And you browser execute it on the fly. So in other words, that means that a browser is a remote code execution engine. And interestingly enough is as well that actually remote code execution is as well the name of a vulnerability. And if you participate to bug bounty program to find security vulnerabilities and you find one of them, you are likely to get a lot of money because it's the dream of any attacker to be able to execute arbitrary code remotely. And so basically that gives a special meaning to the origin of the code that you execute within the browser. So that's why uh, there is HTTPS that comes to the rescue. And with HTTPS you have three uh, security guarantees. The first one is you want to identify the server, I mean to who the, the code that you execute the, the origin of this code. The other thing is you want as well confidentiality. That's the one where most of the people know. So it's encryption. You want to keep secret information you are sending over a insecure network. And as well, integrity. And here what I mean is that you can ensure that there is no data which is added, deleted, or even modified during the transport. And often I think I, think I hear is people complain, yeah, OK, certificate, you have to pay for it. and but not anymore. There is this project, Let's Encrypt. And here you can get certificate for free. And it's really easy to use. There is as well a small CLI tool you can use where you can define uh, which web server you are using and the operating system. And then you see the command you have to type. And then you can even automate it to issue, to generate the CSR and to get a new certificate. So that's really something you can use. And as well, oh, it's pretty bad uh, rendering. Okay. Um, another tool as well is um, if something I can see very often in project is there is some issue with um, debugging uh, SSL connection or so. Sometimes there is the intermediate certificate missing, and then um, yeah, it's um, the developer don't really know how to deal with that or to find out what's wrong. And what you can use here is the this SSL labs is a scanner where you put the URL. And then um, you can see all the things which are wrong, and uh, it tells you wh what you have to do to fix it. And it's really easy to debug afterwards. <clears throat> so um, 
now to the first topic. So HSTS stands for Strict Transport Security. And what HSTS tries is to uh, mitigate against the weakness, t I mean, user, I mean, TLS implementation weakness in browsers. And the first of them is like if you type a new URL in address bar without the scheme, it's going to default to HTTP requests and not to HTTPS. That's the first thing. Then you expose as well to SSL stripping attacks, this kind of stuff. Another thing that you that's possible, and I'm sure almost everybody of you already did it, is when you get a certificate error, you can add an exception. And this is as well bad. And is that HSTS will help us with that, as I will show it later. And as well, many browsers allow mixed content. That means some content you can like download, like image and so you can download them even via HTTP. If the website on HTTPS, the browser allow that, depending if it's active or passive kind of type of data. And as well uh, with cookies. They are not subject to same origin policy, so there are attacks where you can intercept like an HTTP request and then make a redirect, and then you are able to extract a cookie which is supposed to pass over HTTPS if, um, if they forget to put the secure flag on it. So yeah, HSTS is going to help us to solve this problem. So basically what it does is it rewrites all HTTP requests to HTTPS, and all certificate error will be considered as fatal. So if we, for instance, if you go on a website and there is a problem with the certificate, you see this, uh, yeah, this error message. And then most of the people click here. And then what they see is this link. And then they will click on it. And the big problem here is maybe it's really a certificate who has expired, or there is, um, or maybe you are at risk from an active network attack where, for instance, you have an attacker that has like a wifi pineapple. That's something I bought two weeks ago, and I played a little bit with that in an airport, and I was really surprised to see how many people add an exception. And then you are really, it's really, really easy to uh, sniff all the credential. And like here was like somebody was connecting via, to Facebook, and here we had like a uh, username, password, and uh, I mean, that's something that everybody can do. It's $99, and so you see really, every time when you add an exception, think about What's, hap what's, what's actually, what the consequence might be. And if you have HSTS deployed, then uh, you can click again, but then you get a nice error message. I mean, it's a message that tells you, okay, this page is HSTS, and um, yeah, that there is no more way to click to add an exception and then to, uh, to access the website, so it's blocked. So I think, yeah, that's the major benefit you get with HSTS. So how does it work? So the first thing is when you make a request of HTTP, it's always good to have a redirect to HTTPS. This is not part of the spec of HSTS, but you will need it in order to preload it into browser. That's something I'm going to explain a little bit later. But so what happens is then when you have the HTTPS request, um, you get a header, the strict transport security header, where you have the max age. And like here, it, it's in second and it's uh, one year. And during this period of time, what happens is that uh, the browser is going to know that he has to cache this policy during this period of time. And that means that all subsequent requests have to be over HTTPS. So what, what happens if you have a big website, you decide to go to, H to deploy HSTS, and you still have some link which are HTTP? That's not a problem, because if uh, HSTS is deployed, um, the browser is going to issue a request, and then you have a local redirect, a 307. So that means the request never goes to the network of HTTP. Everything ha happens locally in the browser. And then uh, the HTTPS request is issued. And then, yeah, you get the response. And something you can do as well is if you have a website which relies on multiple subdomains, uh, you can add this directive, include subdomains, and with that, um, you can, as then, yeah, you, it means it's going to protect them all. But something you need to be careful with that is always set it uh, HSTS on the top level, because the thing is, if you only set it here, only subdomains of a.foo.com will enforce HSTS. But what you want is, as well, the top level, actually all the ones which are below. So the best practice is if you have, like, a website, so always issue a request to the highest you can. 
So you are sure that all your requests will be will enforce HSTS. And okay, how do you revoke it? So basically, it's something which is cached in the browser. So one way you can do is set the max age to zero, but the assumption is that the person that visits your website has to revisit again. And um, yeah, so be careful. Don't think twice before you deploy it, because yeah, if somebody don't visit. It then, and you remove HTTPS, it's like you block yourself. It's like you DDoS yourself. And uh, if you, as a developer, you, you, uh, you experiment with it, you can as well, if you use Chrome, type this uh, URL, and then you can see uh, this page where you can uh, configure and delete the, the settings, cache settings. And actually, it's as well a privacy concern, because the thing is, there is an entry which is then written to the file system, and that means that every, every, um, you can know if somebody has visited a website. Um, then there is as well the trust on first use. That's actually yeah, the TOEFL principle. That means the first request is always at risk. So in order to reduce the, the risk, uh, it's possible there is a way how you can hard code HSTS into user agent. And for that, that means hard code. It means really the browser will, will have like a white list of URLs that enforce that. And here you can you have to put the preload directive, and um, that's not enough. Then you have to go on this URL, and you have to register yourself that you want to um, to to be uh, preloaded into browser. So that means that even the first request will go over HTTPS. And uh, here, actually, the redirecting I told you before that's one of the requirements. You always they check it. There is like they check like that you own the domain and different kind of things that the re redirect and as well the. Max age is sh value is at least 18 weeks in order to get it preloaded. But in, even if it's there, you need to wait a couple of months until it gets implemented to browser uh, into uh, Chrome and uh, different other browser. So, yeah. So the thing is, if you do it wrong, you might get into trouble if you lock out all the user. So um, a low risk approach is uh, when uh, I mean first always implement redirection, then as well start with a very low max age, like one minute or so. So even if you do something wrong, then uh, you can test out that uh, you don't lock out your user for too long. And then uh, as well, if you can include the subdomains, actually if you want your uh, domain to be preloaded, that's a requirement as well, to add the included subdomain. And then um, progressively increase the value until 12 months. That's something which is pretty common. And yeah. And as well, then you can submit it to be preloaded if you are sure that you don't want to go back to HTTP. So how does it look like with browser support? So um, HSTS is already very widely supported. We can see here globally, yeah, almost 83%. And uh, yeah. So the next topic is certificate pinning. So now, I mean, with HSTS, we know all the requests will be done over HTTPS. So now uh, let's have a look at another aspect on HTTPS and in general with trust is, uh, yeah, we can have rock certificate authorities that intentionally issue malicious certificate. We can have compromised CAs that as well issue certificate. And the thing is here, uh, basically, if they manage to issue a certificate, your browser is going to validate it and uh, consider it as trusted. So um, there is a, that's how you can actually reduce your circle of trust with the certificate pinning. So just to give a high level picture about how trust is established on the web, um, you have like Bob that wants to visit a website which is owned by Alice and uh, he gets a certificate. And in order to get a certificate, uh, you need to rely on a third, uh, third party. Actually you trust like a certificate authority like VeriSign or somebody, somebody like that. And both have like a private public key and actually the public key that, uh, that that a certificate authority has is actually uh, it's the one which is embedded in the trust store, which is either in your operating system or in um, the browser. And then Alice, you know, to get a certificate, she tells, "Okay, I'm Alice," and uh, she gives as well her public key because she has a set of private and public key as well. And then the certificate authority is gonna sign this piece of information that it verified. Um, with our private key. And then we get like a digital signature and then we 
build this certificate is actually the information of uh, the subject, your Alice, the public key of Alice, and then the digital signature. But then the Bob, when you visit the serv website, he can verify using the public key of the certificate authority and verify if the, the content which has been signed is equivalent with the thing which is exposed here. So that's how trust is established on the web. Um, the problem that you have is, if you look like in Firefox, you have, I don't know, more than 100 different certificate authority. Do you trust them all? That's a question you need to ask yourself. You should see some, yeah. So because the big problem with this trust model that I explained before is if one is compromised, the whole trust is broken, actually. Because your browser is going to validate, and then you think you are in actually in a fake, sec fake, yeah, kind of feeling of security. And that's exactly what HPKP solves. So, yeah, another thing is how bulletproof is it? So I said, if one is broken, then, yeah, the whole trust is broken. And actually, every year you have millions of certificates which are issued. And uh, as well, something is, yeah, it's a commercial security. Certificate authority want profit. Browser vendor, what they want is market share. So it, no one of the both has really security on a top priority. And as well, something that um, a problem is that you can, every certificate authority is able to issue a certificate for any domain without asking permission. That, that's one of, by design, one of the biggest problems. And yeah, the problem is that it's good as the weakest link. And as the past, as it already happened in the past, uh, all these certificate authority have already been hacked. Some even went bankrupt. So how does it work? Again, it's with HTTP headers. We make a request over HTTPS. And then we get this public key um, HTTP header. And here we see uh, two pins, which are actually some information from the certificate, the one that we expect. You need to set at least two pins, because if not, the browser is not going to enforce it. And then, yeah, they get cached by the user agent. As well, it's similar to HSTS. There is this max age, which says for how long it's going to be enforced in the browser. And you can as well include uh, subdomains as well, like HSTS. And then during when you will, will open a new connection, make a new HTTPS connection during the handshake when you get um, the chain of the, I mean, the, the service certificate and the intermediary, then uh, it's going to verify that the information match this hash, actually, which is base64 encoded. So the next thing is what to pin, what, which, which information of the certificate you are going to, to use to identify the certificate. And for that is the public key. Actually, it's the, it's the subject uh, public key information. And here you have uh, some information about the algorithm and parameters and uh, key length. And actually, it's a SHA-2 hash over this information and then this base64 encoded, the thing that you see here. That's how you identify. And for that, uh, as well, you can use there's a cool website called Report URI. And you can type the domain inside, and then it generates automatically the pin for you. Um, so OK, so if you don't use certi certificate pinning, that means your website is going, I mean, the browser is going to accept all certs signed by all certificate authority present in your trust store. So the question is, yeah, you have different level where you can pin, either on the, cert the, on the server certificate, on the intermediate certificate, or on the um, root certificate authority. There are different approach, but as we will see, yeah, your, the objective is to reduce the, your circle of trust. So if you pin the root certificate authority, which is the one on the top level, that means that your browser is just going to validate certificate which have been signed by the root certificate authority. And if you use the intermediate one, it's all the certificate will accept all certificates signed by the given intermediate certificate. And if you use this leaf certificate, which is the one that your server sends, you know that it will only accept uh, a single certificate. That's your certificate. So that's the one that's recommended, because it, it's your small circle of cert trust that you have. Um, another thing is, uh, yeah, you, there is a report mode for, to, to monitor pin validation failure. 
So actually, if somebody mounts a man in the middle attack, you are able on real time to detect it. Because the thing is, if some of the pins don't match, you can define this report URI directive, and then it's going to, um, to send, uh, it's going to post this JSON data structure. And you see here uh, all certificates which have been served, and plus the one which have been validated, and then as well the port, host name, different information, so you can see uh, what happened. And the problem is, if you deploy it wrongly, you might again lock, make a DDoS user, so you don't want that. So what you can do is use this report only mode, and then again uh, start maybe with a low uh, max age, and then uh, until you are really sure what you are doing. And then you can sh remove actually the report mode. And actually, if you have a website and don't want to implement new uh, service uh, for monitoring, uh, there is this free service report URI you can use, where and it, yeah, and it's free and you can it generates URL. You have just to put them in the HTTP header and then you can see like you have a dashboard where you can see all the violation. And it's really nice to monitor and so yeah. If you deploy something important, is always um, yeah you have to to send two pins and always make a backup pin as well. I mean a backup, uh, make a CSR and. Uh, because the thing is, if at some point your pr private key is compromised of the one on the certificate which is deployed, you need a backup one. So that's why I always do multiple CSR and add already the pin in. So in this case, um, you can uh, you don't lock out your user. And yeah, and then you can add all the different other directives like HSCS has as well. And um, Use first on the report only mode and ensure that, yeah, and then when you're sure that it works fine, just remove the report only. And in terms of browser support, uh, we can see that already more than 60, almost 61% already support it. And uh, yeah. So the next topic is uh, content security policy. So basically, what you get with the, in general, when you talk about web security, is more about uh, things that you secure on the back end. But actually, with the, as we discussed before, the browser is like a remote execution engine. And what, what the HTTP header and the policy that you give with it uh, gives you is the power to take control how the web app is going to be executed within the browser. And uh, so with CSP, what you can, you can, is like a, you can defend against a code injection attack, XSS. Uh, click checking, or um, as well, malicious cont like different malicious content source. You can you have a mechanism of whitelisting that I'm gonna show just after, and much more. So how does CSP work? Is it a bit different than HSTS and certificate pinning? I mean, it's again, yeah, you have a request, then you get the CSP header, and then you define a policy that I'm gonna show an example after. And the thing here is CSP doesn't cache any settings. Um, it's just on the fly that he enforces it. So you get this, then you execute the page and enforce it on what is, exec what is currently executing. And the thing is, depending what kind of content you have, you might have different um, policies, depending the page you are displaying. So that's an example of a CSP policy from GitHub. Uh, something uh, that I hear quite often is it's pretty confusing to read, and I agree with that, but uh, I will show you actually what, what it exactly means and why it often they become quite big. So one of the first thing when you define a CSP policy is a default source, and the default source is basically the directive that is going to say what are the source of content like for JavaScript, HTML, and so that you trust. So here you can define it like with self. Self stands for the same origin policy. That, that, that means that you only trust things that comes from the same host, uh, scheme, host, and port. And you can as well define none and then use other directive, more explicit directive to say explicitly which source you want to use. Um, you can as well put uh, a specific URL inside to say which one is trust or a list of uh, URLs. 
And as well, uh, you can set uh, something I have seen recently in a project was as well a star. So yeah, please don't do that because it's like uh, you're trusting again everything. So the thing I recommend is really yeah, self. And um, then again, as I say, that's a default one, but then you can overwrite depending which kind of content you want or what you want to do, you can be more explicit. So once you have defined the default source, you can say, oh, like for script tag, you can maybe add another CDN or so. Then as well, connect source for AJAX request or WebSocket. You can define as well here which uh, URL you trust. And as well for iframes, when you want uh, to def define the content that an iframe can display, you can as well whitelist the source of the content. Font as well, if you use a CDN and so, you can put the URL there. Image, then as well for media, object, and style. Actually, it's always the same approach. You can be define very explicitly what you want to whitelist. So a small example uh, is here. I have defined um, the CSP policy actually in a meta tag here HTML. You can do that. It's not the recommended way. It's just actually for the sake of the demo so that you can see the, the policy defined here and then what happens in the browser. So here I have a small page where I embed a script from some CDN, here AngularJS, and um, as well an image from yeah, Voxdays. And then if I enable the CSP policy with, with this header, then the browser is going to refuse to execute the page. And we see here in the error message, it says refuse to load the script, AngularJS, and as well the image. And uh, it says, yeah, either you have to define the default source or in the image source, which is the more explicit one. So now if you want to make it work, uh, you need to whitelist it. So here, that's, I added this image source with the URL and as well the script source with the URLs. So now then it's, it's going to work. And yeah, as you can see, the page is being rendered. So another thing that uh, yeah, XSS helped us with is uh, to protect against XSS. And uh, so first, what is XSS and why is it so bad? So XSS is when an attacker is able to execute malicious code within your website browser's context. That means actually the one which is sandboxed by the same origin policy. And that means an attacker can, for instance, steal uh, your credential, like if he renders a login form which is then going to send some data somewhere else or, for instance, uh, hijack a user session, such as uh, cookie, if you forget to add the HTTP only um, flag, or, for instance, as well, to change your data, which is either in the session storage or in webs, I mean, uh, local storage, and uh, even cookie. And then, yeah, you can execute arbitrary code, so it's pretty scary. So just in a nutshell how it works, I'm going to show you the reflected XSS. So usually an attacker wants to attack a victim. In this case, it's Alice, that's the bad guy. He sends a link which contains some malicious payload in a query string parameter, for instance. And then Alice is naive, click on the link. Then, um, then yeah, it, the browser executes the request, forwards the payload to the server, gets reflected back. And then uh, when it goes back in the browser, then it's, uh, it's, it's, it gets executed. So there are different kinds of XSS. That's a reflected one. Uh, there is as well the DOM XSS. For that, uh, actually, everything happening in the browser. Happen actually, I can see that the more and more often, uh, because the more and more logic is shifted to the front end. And um, in this case, like if you use like inner HTML or like a document write or these kind of things with untrusted data, then you are at risk of uh, DOM XSS. And then there is as well the stored one. If an attacker managed to store somewhere uh, some data which contain a XSS runner uh, payload, then everybody which is going to visit the page, it will be automatically executed. So it's even worse. So an attacker might, for instance, inject something like this via query string parameter, like a script tag and an alert document cookie, or something that looks like an image like image source X, which is always wrong. So you always invoke the event handler, and then this gets executed. And something important is, if you want to mitigate against XSS, is to always and output encode in the correct, in the, in the right context. If it's for a URL, is URL encoded. If it's HTML, is HTML encoded. And if we JavaScript escape it correctly, like backslash and so, 
And that's the first, uh, that's actually the, the way how to mitigate XSS. But what CSP help you is to prevent like inline, scri inline scripts and so. And actually is always is as well a good practice to s separate the logic from your template. So um, actually, yeah, it's kind of a second uh, layer of defense. And the thing is, not all browser are CSP compliant yet. And uh, because of this, uh, if a browser is not, yeah, you, you are not protected. That's why it's just a secondary, uh, like a yeah, layer of defense. So per default, when you enable CSP, it doesn't allow inline script and disable all event handler and even inline styles and all dangerous JavaScript function that take uh, some, a string and then generate code out of it. And I will show some example about that. So again, here, um, if the attacker managed to in inject this payload and CSP is enabled, as we can see here, in this case, the browser refused because the ISA it's violate the uh, CSP policy. And then there are different way how you can either uh, kind of whitelist. I'm going to show later. But yeah, per default, it doesn't allow. And something you can add if you want to say, oh, you want to enable script, inline script, you can add this unsafe inline. And then the browser is going to come here, execute until here. And uh, because you told to the browser, is allowed to have inline script. But it's a bad practice. So if you can, try to avoid that. I just wanted to show now, if you use a dangerous function such as eval, in this case, now we are unsafe inline. That means the browser arrives here. If you try to execute this eval, then the browser is going to say, no, it's an unsafe function. I don't do that. So if you want to do that, you can um, whitelist, uh, say that you allow this behavior with unsafe eval. But always, if you can, try to uh, avoid these two keywords. Because it's actually, yeah, you are more, you are more exposed. So just to show you how it works. And then, yeah, in this case, you can see you get this alert box and it gets executed what came in. Um, OK, so what if you really badly need an inline script? In this case, um, what you can do as a, a way is to make uh, a hash over the payload, I mean, the data which is between the two script tag, and then to base64 encode it and to add it to the whitelist here as we see our script source, and we allow this SHA-2 hash of the content here. And then your browser is going to accept it. So you can really, if for some reason you have to do that, you can really say this inline script allow this one, this one, this one. So you can whitelist them. And if some if website as well, then as a XSS vulnerability somewhere, the attacker managed to inject another script is not going to work because it's not in the whitelist. Um, yeah, so the same mechanism apply as well for inline style. So here as well, uh, if I add something like this, um, yeah, the browser is not going to render the page. It's going to block, and then you can whitelist it. And here, yeah, that's how you do. SHA-2 and then base64 encode it and add it in the whitelist. And something else that CSP can do as well is uh, every, most of the browser have XSS filter. And with this XSS filter, you can say how they behave. Actually, it's against reflected XSS attacks. And here, uh, you have like three possibilities, like allow. That means you d disable this heuristic system that try to detect if it's a reflected XSS, which is not recommended. You can either filter. That means that if the browser detects something suspicious, it removes the dangerous bits and you continue executing. It's as well not the most secure one. The most secure one is use the block. So if there is something suspicious, the rendering engine blocks. And yeah, that's the one I showed here. So define your policy and then reflect the XSS and say block. And probably most of you already know this header. That's the, currently the one which you see mostly on the website, the XSS protection set to one where you enable this filter and then you say mode block. So actually, it's, it, the objective of both is the same. The only thing is this header is not really, for now, it's not deprecated because CSP support is not yet, I mean, not every browser supports it yet. So that's why if you deploy already this, it's going to enforce only on browsers that enforce that, that already have CSP implemented. But this one, edit as well. I think 
until every browser supports it, yeah. Because if a browser is not CSP compliant, is you are not protected. So that's why for 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 the meanwhile, for, I mean for the time being, just add both. Another thing as well that CSP uh, can mitigate is click jacking. So basically, click jacking is when an attacker frame your website. In this case, it's Twitter, and you have the impression that you are actually clicking on this website, but with some actually you are on the Twitter page. And you can just with playing a little bit with CSS, controlling the Z index, the order of the layers, and the opacity, yeah. And then you can hijack hijack the clicks, and then do whatever you want on the other website. So it um, CSP as well as a directive that helps us to control, to, to, to limit who is allowed to um, frame us. So there is this frame uh, ancestor directive. If you put a star, that means everybody can frame you. If you put self, just your origin. And frame ancestor, you can put as well a list of if you have some like partner website that have to rent to uh, frame some of your content, you can add that. Or you can even set it to none, which is the most secure one. So it's not possible to, nobody can frame you. And here as well, for the moment, it's recommended to keep both. The one, uh, the header which has been used so far as well, the XFO header, where you have the deny, same origin, allow from, which is actually the same mechanism. But uh, in the future, I really think it's gonna replace, uh, the CSP is gonna replace all these kind of headers. So you will really define just the whole policy in CSP and that's it. Um, yeah, with CSP you can as well uh, monitor when there are violations on your website. And for that you have this report URI directive where you can say, oh, that's my endpoint. And then every time when a browser detects something uh, that violates the policy, it's going to post a JSON data structure and then you can see w what happened. And when you deploy it, um, yeah. First, define uh, your default source, define uh, your report URI. That's really, um, I mean, that's really good. And as well, first in report mode and then remove the report only as soon as you are sure that everything works fine. Yeah. And actually, that's something really nice is you, are, you have really real time monitoring if somebody tries to attack you. I think these are pretty nice things. Um, yeah. That, uh, in the future, we can, like, yeah, we can really monitor that. And I saw many companies, I mean, some companies, they don't even enforce it. I think it's already very valuable if you know when you get attacked, even without blocking it. Um, so basically, there are different versions of CSP. Uh, the first one, I mean, the CSP one is already very widely de uh, deployed. As you can see, most, almost 86% already support it. And then there is the CSP2, which has like newer mechanism, the thing with the hashes and so that I showed before. It's, uh, it's part of the CSP2. Here it's a little bit lower, but already, uh, yeah, 62%, which is not bad. And this morning while I was preparing the slide, I just came across this page. So uh, two weeks ago, there was a CSP uh, level three has been published. So I really think it's, um, I think it's really how the, yeah, the, it's, it's the, yeah, the way it's really powerful and I think there will be the more and more things that you can control over using CSP. And yeah, just there are currently different specification as well. And here you can see yeah, what uh, CSP version one supports, what the second one like adds or if it deprecates something. And as well, there are other things like the thing where you can as well force to use like if you have HTTP requests to upgrade to HTTPS, something similar to HSTS, but just that it doesn't cache in the browser. And as well, refer if you can, like, say no refer or these kind of things. So I think it's really going to evolve. And it's, um, yeah, uh, and the CSP3 adds a new world, which is going to make it easier to deploy CSP. And uh, where you have less to define whitelist, you, you can whitelist on one level, and then if another script which has been whitelisted, rely on other things, it will be trusted by default. It's kind of a chain of trust. And yeah, so actually that's already uh, my last slide. So I really think the web is maturing towards a secure web platform. Um, yeah, so all these headers are like uh, defense in depth. Um, 
uh, security control that allows to significantly reduce the attack surface. And yeah, use them with caution, especially uh, HSCS and certificate pinning, so you don't lock out all your user. And something I really like about this header is actually it's really security for free. I mean, it doesn't take much time to deploy them. And it's, yeah, and start using them today. Any question? Yeah. Mike is coming. Yeah. Hi. Uh, during the first uh, half of your presentation, we've seen that uh, HSTS and, and HPKP can protect against men in the middle. Uh, I right? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. <laughs> well, it's kind of echo. Can you repeat, please? Okay. Uh, uh, during the first half of your presentation, yeah. we've seen that uh, HSTS and HPKP yeah. can be used to prevent uh, men uh, in the mi mi middle, yeah. right? Now, it has uh, occurred to me that suppose a man in the middle does uh, show up and he somehow steals your DNS, he can effectively use the same HTSTS to lock you out. Is that the case? To lock me out? Yes, if they yeah. present the same things and present themselves as yeah. the real I mean, guy, you yeah. will be out. Yeah, if, if it's proof on the DNS level, yeah. Okay. That's, yeah, because you check on the DNS, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the domain name, yeah, that's, yeah. that's true. So the advice would be implement this as soon as possible so that as many browsers as possible yeah. get the information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah. Hey, thank you. An awesome presentation. Uh, so if you're building a web application that has a web front end that yeah. is communicating with, with the web app through JSON, yeah. and you have to have a token to authenticate a user, yeah. where would you store it? Where do you store it? Yeah. So G given the CSP policy. I mean, so such a token, I mean, you can store it as a cookie. If you do that, don't forget to put the secure flag so you know it's always sent via GPS. You can set it um, as well. I mean, you, you have to set as well the HTTP only flag. But then, uh, like most uh, like uh, front end, like AngularJS, what they do is like they decorate it, they read a value, and then they add it as a HTTP header all the time. So in this case, I mean, if you use a cookie, you won't be able to do that. The browser is gonna send it automatically when the path and the domain match. And um, th that would be one approach using cookies. But the thing is, if you have cookies, you are at risk of cross-site request for a attack. So. If you don't, and if you don't use them, you have no risk with cross-site requests for JTAG, but you are at risk with uh, XSS attacks because then there is no way where you can say this piece of information, JavaScript is not allowed to access it because by design, that's what you want. So in this case, uh, I mean, what I, I used to do is uh, I write like in Angular, if it's like a service that contains this within a function, like you have your scope, and then, um, yeah, you, you have to keep it there, and then, I have the, an Angular interceptor that always read out and add it as a HTTP header. Wouldn't so it be more secure just to put it in local storage if lo you have a good CSP the policy? Pro the problem is with local storage, if you put it there, everybody has access to it, which is in the same origin. But if you put it in a function, you have like, for default, our JavaScript makes a scope, it's like protected, it's like within, the scope is within the function. So that's why I prefer this approach. Because whatever everybody, if I manage to put a small script somewhere, I can read out local storage. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, uh, with key pinning, uh, here. Uh, with key pinning, if you pin to the leaf node, uh, what happens when the certificate expires? I mean, it, it will be a different uh, certificate when you renew it, right? Yeah. Um, Oh, okay, the problem, the thing is, you always need to give two pins. That's exactly one. Either 
you get compromised and then you need to change, you revoke your certificate and then you, um, you have always a backup pin. So actually, in the two pins I displayed before, the one is the one which is currently deployed and the other one is either the one that, a CSR that you did, that in the future you are gonna then issue a certificate by a certificate authority. So basically, because the information, the subject, public information, this doesn't change. You have to generate your CSR, send it to a certificate authority and then it's already deployed on all the, all, all the users that served your website previously. Yeah, and if you don't add, yeah. But it, let's say you deploy CS, uh, certificate pinning without, with, with wrong pins, then you're in deep trouble. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, if it's not the case, thank you.